are back for episode four of On the Brink of Death. This is um, a really, really special opportunity to come together as a um, community. And um, we actually started this as a part of a broader program, Remembering Who We Are, which began when the pandemic hit. And we were thinking, what is it that we can do to really serve this community um, and to serve anybody who would come and join us? And we thought opening up our own, what we call spiritual start, the way that we would start the day to have a spiritual orientation and be really aligned with the self, um, opening that up to the public was what we felt we could offer people, um, which we couldn't think of any other thing that would be more beneficial than really being aligned with the actual self, the soul. Um, so we began remembering who we are. Um, and this uh, special series of On the Brink of Death comes at the anniversary, the one year anniversary of our Remembering Who We Are weekly gathering at the same time. And this program is designed to help us um, with the different challenges that we face to see that even in the light of the most extreme challenges facing death itself, we can live as the real self. We can experience the soul. And so we have uh, an amazing uh, guest that we are really excited to uh, offer the presence of, Sachinandan Swami, who has been faced with so many life-threatening situations and will be telling the story of several of them. Um, in this episode, he will focus in on uh, a story of how he was on the brink of death and what are the learnings that he got from that for our benefit. Um, and so the story will be the bulk of the session and with any remaining time, then we can open up for questions. Uh, we will close at 1 p.m. Eastern time and, uh, and then we'll have a half an hour with Sachinandan Swami for question and answer. Um, so then at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time, uh, for those of you who would like to stay with us, that will wrap the Q&A. And uh, you can send your questions throughout the session to Michael. So you can direct message Michael anytime you have a question, um, and then he will share and will ask as, uh, as there is opportunity. So just a, a point about the culture that we're trying to create together. Um, we value three things very highly respect we want this to be a really safe space where there is uh, a lot of respect that people can feel uh, palpably we also ask for full-hearted participation so whether you are asking a question whether you're in listening mode whatever we're doing let us be fully present full-hearted and open and receptive um, let us please not be divided or multitasking. And it's also super helpful to have your video on for that purpose. And also just so that we can be really a community together and see each other. Um, the last thing is determination. So we don't want to just hear something today and say, oh, that was nice. You know, I really enjoyed that. What we want is the determination to live these teachings. It's a, such an opportunity to hear from Sachinandan Swami, his experiences, his realizations. And um, if we are determined to become receivers, the benefit, uh, I can assure you, will be immeasurable. That is my own experience. Um, and so Sachinandan Swami is my guru. He uh, is someone who is writing and teaching and tr he's traveled all over the world sharing his practices and philosophy from the bhakti tradition he's been a monk for 50 years practicing and um, has just such a fascinating life that we couldn't resist um, showcasing these stories of being on the brink of death for you so with that we are really honored to welcome each of you and 
Sachinandan Swami, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being with us from Germany. So thank you all very much to again come on this call uh, on the brink of death. Uh, today we will uh, go into a, a learning experience which a death or almost death <laughs> presented to me on a golden tablet, I could say. Um, to start with, I should say that I felt drawn very early to the spiritual path. Mm. My father was quite active under Adolf Hitler in the Second World War. And when he came back from the war and decided to have a family, he was torn because of the experience he had made. Uh, the experience being that life is just so uh, evasant, I think you call it, uh, it uh, evaporates so easily um, under the forces of time and history that uh, the question is really there of what is the real meaning of this short uh, episode which we call life and uh, mm, yes he would ask these questions at the evening uh, uh, dinner table and uh, uh, maybe it was his persistent questioning of any material goals that made me take up the spiritual path so early. Mm. I remember he once quoted a quotation and, uh, of C.G. Jung and I had uh, forgotten it but I asked him just recently what that was and uh, he provided it to me. He, sa he said, the main driving force, so far as it is possible for us to grasp, seems to be in essence only one thing, an urge towards self-realization. Uh, what Jung means with self-realization is uh, something a little bit different from the different spiritual traditions. He means more uh, self-actualization, that is to really live your life fully and come uh, to realize the various opportunities and layers uh, that are coming with your personalities. Mm. Uh, yes, so that drive to fully uh, realize the opportunities which life had given to me made me mm, turn into a monk when I was quite young. Um, uh, uh, I left my higher education, I left my friends, and in short, I left my entire old life. I became like I'm dressed now. Uh, short hair, I had a very artistic hair dress, uh, and simple monk uh, clothing. Um, uh, it was quite radical for my friends. Years later, uh, after I had turned a monk, maybe 20 years or so later, uh, they had a reunion. All the uh, friends who were in this one class mm, and they wanted to know who everyone, what everyone had become. <laughs> and uh, one was a politician 
another uh, is a, a physicist who works in in Geneva to find a to, in, in a atom what is it called a collider atom collider where they want to find the finest and subtlest this past parts of matter another is a director of a radio program and so on mm, and somehow they spotted me somehow uh, mm, they could uh, find me and they invited me also so uh, after we had discussed um, yeah. what has become out of you and after we had shared our favorite memory in the school class they said what you did was so radical for us we even didn't know where to find you there was a rumor amongst us friends that you had become a Lama in Tibet and when you crossed the Himalayas to come to India you fell down an abyss in the mountain and, and died uh, but there were talks about you uh, that you had become uh, an accomplished yogi and, and uh, you had follow us so that was th th that that type of talk was there that type of reaction was going on to my own choice mm. yes i had left everything behind but what had i gained my dear people spiritual life is not so much about what you leave behind it's about what you gain. Negation in itself is not yet life. And I had to learn that. I had to learn it by the greatest from the greatest teacher, death or the threat of death. Mm. My story starts around 1976 I was 22 years old mm, and I as I said to you had really left so much behind but I had not really gained anything the space inside was clear of old stuff but it needed to be filled with love and trust and a deep, deep knowing I have arrived at the perfect place that was not there. Uh, instead, I felt restless. Uh, oh, I live a life of a very poor man. I come from such a different background. I live such a simple uh, life. Uh, I had heard that most of my friends were on the way of material progress, uh, but I had not uh, uh, gotten anything, in no, in neither in the material sphere, sphere not, nor the spiritual sphere. And at that time, when I was slightly insecure, something kicked in that I have come to term uh, as the inner critic. Uh, I do know that this is a common term in psychology, but uh, uh, maybe I want to tell you what I mean with this. When we are not in our strengths, oh, there's a voice, a relentlessly speaking voice to us. Oh, look at you. You are too fat. Oh, look at you. You are not knowing anything. Oh, look at you. You have not achieved anything. 
a relentless inner critic uh, that speaks from a subconscious realm to us and, and seems to spit into everything which we do so that we cannot enjoy anything of it. Th that was really very pronounced. In fact, I always remembered mm, a confrontation which my father had mm, with my spiritual teacher. Uh, he had met him uh, earlier that year mm. when he visited Germany and uh, my father was a little angry at him. You have taken my son from the path of material progress which I have uh, developed for him. Um, he should be by now uh, on the way to become a CEO but uh, you have taken him but this won't work. My father had said, you are trying to bring a, a culture from India, a spurt of culture, to Germany. This is as if you want to transplant a crocodile from the river Nile in Egypt into uh, the river Rhine. Rhine is a, a river which goes through central Germany. It's a vast river. I mean, not as big as the Hudson, but almost as big. What will happen if you bring a crocodile which is used to a warm habitation and then transplant it into a cold river uh, of a different climate? Uh, and uh, so how can you hope that this spurta culture of India will make it in, in the West? You have set up my son for failure. That is my accusation against you. My spiritual teacher had uh, listened very carefully and then he had told my father, the son is not a member of the East or the West. In the same way, true spiritual wisdom and the spiritual path is not Eastern or Western. And then he had said his punchline, which my father, who is now 96 years, still remembers fondly. He said, you can become enlightened in your suit and tie. <laughs> in other words, you don't have to change anything in the cultural um, field because this is not about Eastern culture, Western culture. Stay in your Western culture, but practice the spiritual path, which is of universal relevance. It has an overarching value. Anyways, so I was in that space where I had just withdrawn from the world, uh, but I had not yet found my real uh, spiritual identity. And uh, in that space, these nagging doubts, will it work? Is it not too Eastern? Uh, will it work even for my own <laughs> mind? Uh, where, where, where haunting me, yes, uh, and spoiling uh, everything. What I learned later is something which I want to read to you to make the problem really clear and put it before everyone. It's something which I have discussed, uh, um, I mean it's an author whom I have discussed with Hari Prasad, uh, Richard Rohr, he writes in the, a very good book, Falling Upward. He writes, um, mm, the sacred space is where your old world is able to fall apart. but the new world has not yet emerged. 
This is the liminal space in our life. If you don't dare to go into this lim liminal space, you will start idealizing normalcy. In other words, he encourages us. Yes, start your spiritual journey. Be bold, move forward. But he also says this is a state where we are betwixt and between the familiar and the completely unknown. This threshold is God's waiting room. Here we are taught openness and patience as we come to expect an appointment with a divine doctor. Imagine you, you understand, I think. I think many on this call are in this situation. They also know, ah, this materialistic life is really not what I want. It's... Ah, it's, it, it lacks substance. It does not fulfill me. Um, but uh, now we have come into the waiting room <laughs> where we don't yet know what will be the new uh, life. He says this is a threshold and he says here we expect an appointment with a divine doctor, divine intervention that makes it clear this is your new life, this is your new path, this is your new identity, this is what you are meant to be and to live. Ah, very nice, very nice quotation. Mm. For me, uh, uh, something happened in the waiting room that catapulted me forward and made me really into the person which I started to become. It was a process, but uh, I was set on the right way. I told you already it was the year 1996. Mm, I had gone to Berlin. Mm, uh, the idea was to open uh, a space where people could come and learn uh, spiritual life. Uh, and Mm. Uh, uh, the schedule was like this. I was getting up early at around 4 o'clock. Then I had a very extensive morning program together with, my, with the other monk, uh, Jai Gora. Uh, and around six, 7 o'clock, not around, it was on the minute, at 7 o'clock we would meet for a little ceremony and then we would do some reading together and discussion and uh, the whole program ended around 8.30 uh, every day. I must say the only time in that time when I was full of doubts and unwell and, and waiting in the waiting room with nothing happening really, uh, the only good time for me was this time when I was in my morning practice uh, and when I was in that room which we called the temple room. Yes, we were running a spacious uh, uh, spiritual center in the midst of Berlin. And after the morning program we would be very, very busy. Uh, mm, I have uh, written it down. Uh, we would mm, mm, invite the public to come. I would give classes in meditation uh, or philosophical lectures. I taught the Bhagavad Gita at that time. And um, then during the day I would be outside giving uh, lecture appointments. I always uh, uh, spent two, day, two hours a day sitting as a monk in the center of Berlin and making music, meditation and music right there. And there was always a huge crowd of people around uh, me. Sometimes they were challenging, some were asking very submissive questions. The police was going by in the car, 
they looked at that unusual monk who had a huge uh, discussion right there on the street and they said oh, monk 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 let the monk do you know we need a, little, a few peaceful people in the town <laughs> and, and uh, yes uh, it was like this so one uh, Sunday morning my busy empty world <laughs> exploded I call it busy I was doing many, many things, but the heart was empty because I had not yet uh, uh, received a very clear indication of uh, identity, of inner arriving. To be busy, Socrates said, beware of a busy, empty life. <laughs> so I was, I was overcompensating my, my emptiness with a lot of activity. So th it was Sunday morning. Uh, I don't know how it is in New York, but in Berlin, everyone is asleep at Sunday morning, except the two monks who were doing their rigid morning program and so on. We had come on that day to the end of the reading and we at the end of the reading we did something we bowed down we paid our obeisances all i then something happened so fast first i had i heard gunshots then bullets just digging themselves uh, just mm, centimeters above me into the wall then I remember I was covered with this white plaster from the walls and then I heard the sound of screeching wheels <laughs> of a car driving at fast speed away from us I got up from my obeisances. I looked at the other monk and I said, what was that? And he said, we just have been shot at. I didn't hear the end. <laughs> I heard we just had been shot. So I thought this was an afterlife <laughs> situation. I was so bewildered because it was just so loud and, and, and so aggressive and so absolutely different and such a, that I was really bewildered. I looked around, I saw the bullets in the, in the, in the, how do you say, in the, in the wall. <laughs> Jaigora, the older monk, had run out to see who it was, but he came back and he said, I, I just, I, I, I saw a car around this, the corner, but it could be any car. I did not, uh, and I don't, don't know what car it is. The, someone shot at us, wanting to kill us. And then I understood. Now I've made a little drawing for you so that you understand the situation. Mm -hmm. Our temple had a big vo window like this. It was three meters and something high. Then there was a little wall. I'm sorry, I'm a terrible drawer, I know. Um, <laughs> you don't need to have an inner critic to know that. <laughs> and here there was the, the entrance door. And here we were, the two, sitting. So th this is the car who came. And this is supposed to be the gun. So he was, the car was shooting at us. But we went down. You know, when he took aim, in other words, we were sitting up 
like here, then he shot and in the milliseconds, tong, we went down on the floor, not avoiding the bullets, but doing our pious obeisances. <laughs> our, our, it, was, it was the perfect timing uh, to save our lives. And we, we really we understood the whole situation. Wow! This was the reaction of some criminal part of the, of the society. They were not pleased with our monk activities and our bringing spiritual value in the society. In Berlin there's a huge mafia. I know this because one of my disciples is a criminal officer. She's a woman. She says, if you would know uh, what the the underworld it is it, you you would uh, it, I will not tell you it's not good for you to know it's so so vast and so on and and they someone had either hired killers or killers were on our case you know Germany is was not known in the past for being very tolerant I think they are learning uh, the society, but it was at that time very critical towards spiritual life and monks who were outside of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and uh, my dear listeners, it was so mind-shattering when we looked out, the window had come down. Uh, there was no window, this large, huge, four meters windows, it was broken. When we looked on the wall, there were a few bill bullets for each one of us. The, the plaster was there, but, but this, to understand, we were in the only room where we felt very well, the sacred space of the temple, and right into this room, uh, violence had entered. But the real learning was not even that. This was what happened. Each day afterwards, I was thinking, they had come to kill you. They had not negotiated anything. There was no discussion. There was just the very brutal intention to kill you. They had failed this time because they didn't know that um, a monk sometimes pays an obeisances as part of his morning ritual. <laughs> um, they will come again. And each day I lived between two poles. The confidence that there is something like protection for people who are following their spiritual calling. There is a divine umbrella above them. Uh, but then the fear, the very real fear of being an object of violence and being uh, killed by bullets or by knives or by whatever. Uh, 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 they uh, would, uh, the, the, my killers or those who wanted to assassinate me would choose. Every morning when I woke up, I oscillated, I went between these uh, uh, extremes, fear and confidence. And I understood that these two poles are there within our human nature. Fear of the unknown and confidence that if I follow my spiritual calling, that, I, that calling for self-realization, everything will be all right due to divine protection, that these poles, I understood, are there 
all the time working and I need to come to grips with it. I need to understand it and I need to come to a place where I can balance these. Bef I think before you have reached your spiritual confidence, your spiritual realization, there is always fear and uh, the opposite within you. And you need to find some way to balance it. I needed to do it because sometimes the fear got so big in me that I didn't want to go out any longer. I didn't want to continue in Berlin, although we had paid the rent for this really big uh, 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 spiritual center and although people had shown the, uh, showed uh, interest and apparently got something out of it, I didn't know because they had come to kill me and they had failed once but I was a public person, they would come again and shoot at me again and this time they would most probably get me and kill me. This was the classroom. I needed to come to terms with this. The situation was eating at me day and also in the night in the form of my dreams. Um, and I found a solution which uh, uh, is, uh, uh, and I think because of that, this learning experience had been arranged to me, that I was shot at in the midst of the temple. Uh, I needed to fight my spiritual uh, identity, my spiritual calm, my spiritual place. I didn't just need to give up the, uh, the old life. What I learned is that we have the choice between uh, what is called a material perspective and a spiritual perspective. And by choosing the spiritual perspective, the soul life, if you so want, um, the perspective of the spiritual identity, we become fearless. Mm, I did this mm, in the form, I, I developed a little meditation and it is this meditation that I wish to share with each one of you on the call. I don't want to speak theoretically now, I want to speak practically now. I don't wish to tell you my experience, I wish that you make your experience, where you negotiate between these poles, uh, which are always there. Mm -hmm. Fear of the unknown and confidence, uh, which gives you the strength to move forward into that waiting room of God, if you so will, uh, 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 where you are open to new experiences in your own life. I see already uh, some of you are smiling because uh, you know, I, I seen uh, four people before me, uh, you know that now something mm, meditative comes, an experience. Just allow me to get my materials ready. Yes, I am actually ready now. <laughs> I request all of you to find a peace, uh, to find a good position to sit. Some of you might like the chairs, I think they're fine. Mm. I have seen our Michael 
uh, sitting on the floor, that's also good. And the main thing is that you want to sit tall and straight and open your shoulders a little bit by rolling them back. Why? You, you want to increase the, vol uh, the space for your breathing here. Just to tune us in. In this meditation we will exit whatever it is that we are doing and we will try to find our spiritual anchor place. You know in this world there are many distractions. The job can be a distraction, our various relationships that are not essential, society and so on. All these preoccupations are like smoke and one day they will simply dissolve into thin air. We need to arrive of the soul life, the essential life, our true nature. I request you to first of all do a simple centering exercise. Come aware of your feet. Some of you might like to wiggle with the toes. and relax them. Go up from your feet to your knees and then your sitting bones and relax. Move up your spine, your back, and relax. Your chest and your belly area. Relax. Both of your shoulders, arms and hands Relax. The back of your neck, the back of your head. Relax. Top of your head. your forehead, your eyes, relax. If you have not yet done so, close your eyes, focus on your cheeks and relax. Finally, your tongue. Relax. Do a few deep breaths. In and out. Whenever you breathe in, know that you breathe in. And whenever you breathe out, know that you breathe out. Conscious breath. A 
imagine you are completely alone. And let everything that is going on in your life right now gently disappear. Bring your attention to these things in your life and let them disappear. Your various relationships gone. Your job gone. Your important responsibilities gone. Future desires gone. You are now absolutely free to simply be be present. Move your attention now to the heart area and as you continue to breathe, breathe into your heart space. It is here, in the heart space, that the soul is, the self is. We will listen to a wisdom text from the Gita. For the soul there is neither birth nor death at any time. He has not come into being, does not come into being and will not come into being. He's unborn, eternal, ever existing and primeval. He is not slain when the body is slain. Continue to breathe into your heart space and simply feel the existence of that soul, that unaffected self. Continue to breathe in and out. And simply be in that space. The soul is full of inner knowing. It is eternal and it is full of bliss. 
free from the disturbances of the environment. Do a few deep breaths now. Slowly become aware of your environment. Open your eyes and look at your room as if you're seeing it for the first time, even the pictures in your room. When you are ready, look at your screen. <laughs> That's how we say nowadays, look at your screen again. <laughs> I thank you very, very much. I think we had a little technical interference with one of our participants trying to find the mute bottom mm, and uh, it worked out in the end. <laughs> you were successful. Uh, uh, Michael, I don't see you. Are you in Samadhi, in trance? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, the hand is there. <laughs> yes. Mm, uh, no, you may be there. I just um, <laughs> need to take full responsibility of my guided med meditation here. <laughs> I thank you so much, everyone. I, could, I can feel. Mm, maybe it's the training which one has as a monk. Uh, I can feel the community, the common humanity <laughs> which is created uh, Oh, here, someone, my phone dropped. I hope you found it again. <laughs> yes, uh, so, mm, mm, yes, this is full experience. We should have everything drop uh, away at times. Sometimes it, we need to start with our telephone. <laughs> uh, my dear people, it's very simple. The lesson here, which I learned, is I need, it's not enough to leave things behind. It's very important to arrive at the place of the soul, not theoretically, but very practically. And this possibility is there at every time. Now, I do this meditation in an abbreviated form. Mm, uh, whenever uh, you know, in all situations. For instance, today I went out on a walk and sat by the lake and I just breathed in and I mentally divested myself of all the things which are going on, just like I uh, take off the pullover and other cloth when I go in the evening to bed and put them to the side. So in the same way I mentally put all the things to the side and then mm, it's magical then you breathe into the heart space where the soul is and just become aware of it and as you become aware as you point so to say the torchlight of your awareness in that direction it begins to reciprocate uh, you it comes out of the darkness and becomes more uh, feelable, more, uh, uh, yeah, more experienced. And I could see it the, mm, from time to time. I looked at the gallery and I could see some of you were really entering, uh, first of all exiting, but then entering the new spiritual space. Another way to do that 
is to read in the texts of the Bhagavad Gita regularly and then just stop everything, also your reading, uh, relax your body, go to your breathing. Uh, my spiritual teacher says breathing is the bridge to the mind and uh, you come to the mind and you calm it by calm breathing you calm the mind and then you uh, remember what you have just now read in the wisdom text and uh, and uh, dwell in that place and because this is a reality it's not an imagination it is a reality it will begin to shine into your life and you will feel it in your life not theoretically not conceptually but in an experienced way that is what i had to learn when i was gripped with fear and anxiety after that armed attack on me in berlin where the killers wanted to kill me I had found the we had spoken with the police and we showed them the bullets and so on. And they said, "Do you have any information who it was?" Like uh, Jaigora said, "Well, it could have been from the car because, I, but I saw the car, but I was so shocked that I forgot the color of the car, and it may not have been that car. Uh, you know, they were o- obviously professionals." They didn't leave a trace, only the bullets, but uh, there were no fingerprints on the bullets. It was, um, the police said, well, well, we have so much to do in Berlin. Uh, If we ever find a clue, we we will let you know, but we can tell you uh, uh, it's very rare that we find such such, uh, killers. so therefore we had to live with the fear, but also with the experience that we were miraculously saved. I mean, it was a split, split, what is it called in English? A nanosecond <laughs> uh, in which we were uh, uh, felt inspired to, to do our obeisances, something which the killer had never seen in his life. <laughs> and uh, therefore we were spared. Fine, I will stop here. I know that some of you have to exit by the hour, but mm, Ari Prasad will, we will, we will be able to continue for another half an hour. I just wanted to announce mm, the mm, next and last episode is really my most dramatic episode. Uh, it, I will call it in the heart of war. I will not be able to say anything more because it is meant to be a cliffhanger uh, which uh, awakens your interest. (laughs) So I cannot, uh, it's a surprise. (laughs) Uh, Good, so I'm for now, I want to say over to you, Hari Prasad. Thank you so much, Sachinandan Swami. It's thrilling to be with you and to hear from the uh, wild experiences that you've had and what you've gained is so meaningful. Thanks to everyone who has joined us today for your uh, wonderful participation, receptivity means a lot to us to be able to share this with you. Um, We wish you a, a wonderful week for those of you who need to exit now and we'll be back next week at the same time for the last episode of this On the Brink of Death series, episode five. Thank you very much. And for those who would like to stay on, we're very happy to have you for our Q&A now. Thank you so much. So um, I would like to start with a question. Uh, Why did it take getting shot at to come to this point? And how did that connect with your inner critic um, giving you trouble, not finding your identity. It took getting shot at to overcome the inner critic, stopping you from finding your identity. How did you also come to that space? So 
a couple of questions in there. Why getting shot at? And how did you then get to arrive at this space when you've been practicing for so many years? I thank you very, very, very much. Um, let me look at this question from the perspective of neuroscience and then yoga psychology. In neuroscience, we hear that if we repeatedly do something or think a thought, we are hardwiring this uh, thought in our brain. There is a very nice, easy statement. Neurons, neurons that fire together, wire together. They, they built a very, very intricate and hardwired network, which is very difficult to change. Especially uh, habits are so ch hard to change. I think during this lockdown period, when we can't really distract ourselves with so much outside activities, we see how habits which are there within us, habits in thinking, but habits also in acting, are kicking in and we, we thought, oh, it would be nice to give them up, but it's really difficult. There have been uh, whole libraries full of books which give tips on how to mm, break the habit of being me. The, the, for instance, I, I had this book, this was sent to me just for Christmas. I got it uh, from someone. Um, to break habits is not easy. From the yoga psychology, uh, habits, mm, both in thought and in action, are like riverbeds that are deeply ingrained in the ground and mm, that force the flow of the water uh, to always go uh, according to the way it has flown already since centuries sometimes. To dig a new riverbed and then bring the water to flow into this is, is, is a huge effort. So, um, in spiritual life, we do make some advancement, but we come also against what I always call a wall that we cannot cross any longer, that we cannot cross. My wall in the begin in, in the period which I describe was uh, uh, that uh, doubter uh, uh, who doubts that spiritual life is, uh, uh, is, is, is really there. Yes, I had concepts. Yes, I had uh, g gave lectures, but inside of me I was dissatisfied. I felt my life was not moving on. I was far away from the experience of real spiritual life, which is a blissful experience. Uh, mm, uh, an experience which I also call being above the clouds. I was fully under the clouds of uh, my, my mind and, uh, and my uh, upbringing and so on. I was, uh, so to say, uh, I had made my camp on the threshold <laughs> and I didn't move beyond the threshold. So if that is there, uh, we need, I will give a colloquial term for this, a wake-up call. My dear people, it doesn't always have to be a ma machine gun. <laughs> Please don't fear that it will also happen to you. Then you will think this world of life is a dangerous uh, <laughs> affair. No, no. But for a monk like me who had uh, uh, chosen a rather intense experience and an intense path 
uh, I seem to have needed that. Or at least that was the treatment given to me. If I'm perfectly transparent to all of you, maybe painfully tra uh, transparent, I am a hard nut to crack. I'm a son of a warlord. <laughs> My father, if you would hear what he did, you would never speak to me again uh, in, in the Hitler times. Uh, and there is not, uh, there is, it's not by chance that we come into our uh, families, no, in the good, in the families which we are. Mm. So I have a, a, a spiritual searcher, is there, yes, but I think there is also uh, how do you say in good English? A hard nut to crack <laughs> is also there, and I may have, I may have even called for the hammer <laughs> to do the the work, but it does not have to be that extreme. It is mostly not so extreme. It was extreme in my life because I was. Yeah, I brought a lot of karma with me that uh, attracted such intense experiences. By the way, since a few years, mm, nothing that intense has happened. <laughs> of course, no, yeah, a few, few, one, two, three years ago, when I was in Florida, a huge crocodile came after me. I, I, I thought, why always me? <laughs> but my, my good, uh, um, I'm traveling with Gor Krishna, my assistant, he is a jewel. I, he, he will just, I will introduce him, he is here. Uh, he was in the same boat, when we went through the jungle, he didn't even see the crocodile. <laughs> but, but, but there was a third person who saw the crocodile. It was not a crocodile in my mind only, in other words. But he doesn't need such experiences. He is uh, not such a hard nut to crack. To crack. <laughs> Thank you so much. We have a question from Vijay. Uh, what advice do you have for us to skillfully navigate the liminal space when we have left the old, but the new has not yet emerged? What advice for getting to the new um, when we've left the old behind? What a wonderful question. In fact, all the questions which I have gotten show me that you are really with the presentation and you are asking content related questions that show that you are engaged with the subject. This is one of my most uh, dearest subjects to navigate the liminal space, the space in between the uh, old and the new life. In fact I give retreats of different sorts of retreats um, where I uh, am trying to set up an atmosphere where everyone can make the, the experiences which are necessary to make in order to go and find the new life. Mm, to answer your question in brief, uh, you have to put something in this liminal space that helps you to move on. Uh, I'm speaking of spurta practice that is so powerful uh, to, mm, it, it purifies your perception and your heart and uh, it uh, really gives you new uh, 
eyes uh, through which you can see that which is already waiting for you. Spurta practices are so important. What you practice now, that is what you become later. Um, in my quotation, I have call, uh, called this, mm, uh, or, or not I, R Richard Raw called this the threshold. No? Uh, and he gave another word, the waiting room of God. Mm, I think there are mm, two expressions, one for the not so, uh, let us say, religious-minded person, that's the threshold in the waiting room of God is obviously for, uh, for the religious-minded person, but it refers to the same thing. Um, uh, that should not just be a waiting room. You should not just uh, sit on the threshold uh, and, and, and mm, pitch your tent there for a few years. No, 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 by no means. If you, uh, it's important that you become active with a good spirit of practice. And uh, mm, um, I have forgotten your good name, but whoever you are that you asked the question, I really uh, uh, want to suggest to you something. Find good spiritual people. I mean, the, the upbuilt people are wonderful and they are equipped uh, to give you tips on uh, a spurta practice and discuss with them so that you find a practice that is suitable for you uh, and uh, a practice that is uh, just right for you. It is important that you have mm, not a one shoe fits all practice but a mm, practice that is totally f uh, focused for your on your own. I, I would say try to s see that there are three elements in the practice. Mm. Wisdom or knowledge, uh, people who practice that, and finally uh, actually I gave, gave the wrong uh, succession. Uh, you need some some knowledge, some orientation, some guide uh, uh, guiding uh, uh, thoughts. Then you need a practice, and then you need to have association with people who practice it, so that you can ask relevant questions, uh, detailed questions. I call this the two, the three Ps, which everyone who wants to move on has to know. Mm, philosophy, mm, practice, and people. Thank you, thank you. Wonderful. So a question from my mom. Uh, oh, <laughs> didn't we see your mom? <laughs> <laughs> ah, Pamela, I see you. How are you all? <laughs> yes. <laughs> So the question is, what exactly? Yeah, TV, TV. Yes. <laughs> what exactly did you find in your heart as evidence of connection to your soul as a result of your life-threatening encounter? I was so overjoyed with the fact that TV is there she, uh, that my joy uh, was momentarily <laughs> covering my uh, uh, comprehension, my skills of comprehension. <laughs> comprehension. Please again repeat the question. What exactly did you find in your heart as evidence of connection to your soul as a result of your life-threatening encounter? Pain can be sometimes the place from which, from which great joy and insight is born. Mothers know this when they are in labor. It is intense experience, but then after it, mm, the children come. 
or the child comes out. I must say this tremendous experience of anxiety and maybe I was not um, able to connect this uh, or, or, or to, to bring this to your awareness. You know, knowing that a killer is behind you, that is so, such a nerve-wracking uh, experience. I had this once in Kabul, Afghanistan. Mm, you know, I was shadowed each day by a person. And you could you, to turn around and you, you see a hand is disappearing and the next moment you turn around and you see someone is disappearing and I had a threat to my life. Uh, I was um, uh, in Kabul, Afghanistan. I had uh, been teaching in a school. There was a Hindu minority uh, of Hindus from India who lived there, the Afghanistani Hindus. It's a particular ethnic group and they had invited me to teach and uh, and the children became really uh, enlivened. Uh, mm, we had painting contests, contests and soon even grown up who were behind the children took part in the painting contest contests and uh, yeah we became prominent uh, during the fast months uh, the, the Ramadan months uh, and we were shadowed and uh, yes there was an assassinator on my or assassin on my on my case and I knew that experience it had happened in uh, uh, earlier 74 and now again, I knew that there were people behind me uh, who wanted to kill me. And that is, that is psychologically extremely unsettling. You are never safe anywhere. Uh, and uh, in that situation, that painful situation, you can say, that unsettling situation, I took my spur to pray, I took shelter in my spiritual practice. I went really deep in the practice and I came to that soul place. That soul place is always there, but most of us, when we want to go deep, we stop somewhere here and then we go out again. We go next time a little bit deeper, hopefully, we go out and then we try again and then we are on the surface and we don't get deeper. But this experience, taught me there is no shelter for you. you. You almost were killed. I mean, the bullets were this much over my, my head, you know, and my, it couldn't be more dramatic. And the, the bullets, there were more bullets. They are not so expensive for a killer who wants to kill you. Um, and um, that forced me to take my spiritual practice very, very deep. I did more than just the meditation in which I guided you. I uh, mm, mm, uh, did uh, a meditation where I really, uh, mm, how would you say in proper English, confronted my own death. I mean, if you want, I will have a discussion with uh, the team. We will have to see if that is a responsible meditation. I can. I can mm, next time let, let let me see let me let me speak first with your son <laughs> uh, so so yes I uh, there are meditations where you really contact your eternal essence and at that time CB something happened which uh, Gandhi spoke about I will show this to you in he says, birth and death are like two boxes 
which each hold the key to unlock what is in the other box. So if I go deep into the meditation of uh, life, I will understand, well, I'm alive only because there's a life force inside of me which moves these bodies and chemicals Mm, which is also there and energizes the mind. I come to that life force or that soul or that self. And when I go deep enough into the death box, mm, then I will also understand, yes, I'm a mortal being, but there is no death. And with this, I'm shaking off all the fears in my life. And I uh, begin to move around as if I'm dressed in an impenetrable armor. <laughs> uh, nothing can happen to me. I'm an eternal soul. Mm. People who live the soul life become fearless. Mm. So the inner critic, so to say, th that period of the inner critic that was just the whipping lashes, so to say, that drove me into this, uh, not just the experience, but the digestion and the learning of that experience. Thank you very much for your very good question. Uh, <laughs> but I long to discuss uh, at length with you, in, but in real. Uh, coming and visiting your house, seeing the squirrels who go up the trees <laughs> and everything. <laughs> Good. Uh, the next question is from Girlaine. Uh, I think this will be the last one most likely. Um, so she's offering her gratitude for your nourishing words and meditation. Would you um, shed some further light and insight about the hearts and minds of those who are fearful of peaceful beings like you and your fellow monk in Berlin, so much so that they're driven to violence and murder. In short, fundamentally, why do humans hurt each other? Yeah. <laughs> A peace. A monk is often such a contrast to the way people think and act that his very existence puts not only a question mark behind what the people do, but they are perceived as a threat. I would like to give you an example mm, which has moved me very, very much. Mm, I personally profit a lot from genuine spiritual people in, in, in the various world traditions. And I particularly mm, like the teachings of the Sufis and also the Desert Fathers. Who are Desert Fathers? They are Christian monks who have withdrawn from all, from everything to focus only on God. They have gone to the deserts. Mm, uh, yeah, where is it? Syria is a place where they were, Egypt is a place. Morocco, also Tunisia. And they have made their experience in solitude and left a large uh, body of literature with their deep insights, which, you know, are very similar 
to what we can hear in other world traditions uh, uh, who have a contemplative practice, very similar. I have seen many, many um, descriptions of you know, what in my tradition is, uh, is known as the various steps in meditation and so on, almost identical. Anyway, so there was such a peaceful um, desert father um, and he was wise and people used to come to him and uh, to, uh, to learn. I think once of a week he was uh, opening his door or his, his place in the desert for people to come and ask questions. But then it was in Algeria, Algeria or Morocco. I, my memory becomes weak at this uh, uh, regarding the, uh, if it's this place or that place. I tend to believe it was Algeria. I, I, it's, it's 30 years ago or 40 years ago. I, I don't remember very sharply now. Um, there was a rise of um, the local religion's fundament, uh, fundamentalism, uh, not appreciating the spread of Christianity, uh, Christian uh, wisdom. They could not see that this is the same, same because for them uh, religion is a party uh, effort. You know, I'm, I'm in this party and there's the other party. And uh, often there is some struggle between uh, these parties for membership um, and other, other, other things. Mm, so they became alert the fundamentalist of the local religion, and they sent killers uh, after them mm. because they thought it's a threat, not it's an enrichment, like a true spiritual person will think, but it's, it's a threat. Now, this desert father was killed, mm, and next to his corpse, when he was found, um, a letter was found, a handwritten letter. He had written it with his own hand. He had said, I greet you, friend of my last hour. This was addressed to his killer. No? I greet you, O friend of my last hour. So beautiful, so beautiful. Uh, mm, and I pray to the one God who is, our all, who is all of our Father that when you come to me I am able to see you as he would see you. Uh, uh, that is one of his children. This is uh, seeing the true equality of all beings. But uh, if you think spirituality and religious r or religion is a party thing, then you will find in this letter even a grave challenge. Maybe he wants to say that his uh, uh, religion is better than our. It is th this is my understanding. They perceive someone who is so different as a threat. And don't we sometimes also do this in our own way? Mm -mm. Uh, this is common in the uh, psychology of man, to view uh, difference not as a welcome enrichment uh, or enhancement, but to see it as a threat. And Now, how exactly this goes on? <laughs> I'm not a psychologist. Uh, I, can't, I can't say. And I want to tell, uh, I want to say, I don't even want to know because it's, it is so dark. You want to really understand it. You have to go into pitch black darkness. Uh, but not just the darkness in the night. It's the 
darkness of the human mind, which is dangerous. There lurk many, many uh, things. I it is a sad chapter of our humanity, this judgmental spirit. But uh, yeah, it is there. It is part of the reality. It has its place in in this vast creation. Mm. And if the place is to wake us up and and go against the judgment part within us and uh, eliminate the judgment path as we come to maturity, then it serves even a good place. <laughs> I thank you very much. I see uh, the conductor of our program is here, time. <laughs> time, and then it's also Hari Prasad. <laughs> uh, I thank you very much. And uh, mm, mm, I'm very, very grateful for this Sangha or this community which we create, mm, this invisible or even a little bit visible community because they're gallery photos. I will now uh, give uh, over to Hari Prasad and I will look for a moment at your gallery photos. <laughs> oh. Thank you so much, Sachinandan Swami. Such an honor as ever. And thanks to everyone who uh, stayed with us for this precious Q&A time. We can't wait to be back with you next week. We're only sad that it's just the last session. <laughs> so hopefully more to come in the future. Thank you very much. Wishing you a wonderful week. Thank you.